This is the second video on the Seven Kings of Rome following the Chapter 21 video on Romulus and Numa Pompilius. This video will cover the last five kings of Rome, uh, reviewing them all. King number one, uh, Primus Rex Romulus, a Latin, Numa Pompilius, a Sabine. We'll talk today about Tullus Hostilius, a Latin, then Ancus Marcius, a Sabine, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, an Etruscan, Servius Tullius, an Etruscan, and Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, who was also an Etruscan. So we'll start with the third king of Rome, Tullus Hostilius. So he reigned after the second king of Rome, Numa Pompilius. And remember, Numa was very religious minded. It's very peaceful. Tullus Hostilius, as his name Hostilius implies, everything except. He repressed a lot of religious institutions uh, started by Numa. He was much more concerned with warfare. Uh, besides supposedly building the Curia Hostilia, the, uh, the Senate House, which was named after him, Hostilia, until it was burnt down during the first century BC, uh, Tullus mainly concerned himself with war. He's very warlike. He declared war on Alba Longa, which of course is the mother city of the Romans. That's where Romulus and Remus came from. So declaring war on Alba Longa, the Albans and the Romans were fighting, and in the midst of their fighting, they realized that there were, there were a set of triplets on the Roman side and a set of triplets on the, the Alban side. And of course, this has to be an omen from the gods. So we're going to have these triplets fight each other. And whichever set of triplets wins, that's the city that wins the entire war. So no pressure, guys. So we have the Roman triplets, the Horatii, the Horatius brothers, and the Alban triplets, the Curiatii, the Curatius brothers. And here we have Jacques-Louis David's very famous Oath of the Horatii. See the three Horatius brothers giving the very Roman and fascist salute to their swords. They're swearing upon their swords. That's the, their dad. That they will fight. They will destroy the Curiatii and the, uh, the Albans uh, for the glory of Rome. And here we have the family of the Horatians uh, weeping and of course very sad because it's a very uh, exciting yet somber moment. So what happened was is that the, the battlefield was was made empty and the, the two forces formed a ring around these two sets of triplets and they fought. Uh, two of the Horatius, the Roman brothers, went down pretty quickly. But the last Horatius brother, the youngest one, of course, got to be the youngest, his name was Publius, he had managed to wound all three of the Curiatius brothers, and he managed to separate them. So he would run away, and then they would run after him, and they would become separated themselves, and he would turn around, and he would kill them one by one after wounding them. So finally, killing the last one, victorious, he took the bloodied mantle from the, his Alban foe, wrapped it around himself, and he was picked up, carried by the Roman citizens. Uh, when he was taken back to Rome in triumph, his sister, Camilla, saw that he was wearing uh, the bloodied mantle of his foe, of the enemy that he had killed, and she recognized it as the very mantle, the very cloak that she herself had woven, because she was betrothed to that very Curiatius brother, that Alban brother, that her own brother had killed. So when she saw that her betrothed had been killed, she began to cry and weep and scream lamentations. When her brother realized what, had, what was happening, that she was lamenting over a fallen enemy, he jumped down from the shoulders of the Romans and he killed her on the spot, saying that no Roman should mourn an enemy. And yes, that escalated quickly. Uh, the people were outraged. They they arrested him on the spot, put him on trial, and they planned on executing him for killing his sister for sororicide. Uh, but the father, also named Publius, uh, spoke in his defense, saying that he had lost all of his other sons. This was his only son left to him. Please do not execute my only son. And uh, the sentence was commuted, so he was not put to death. 
This may be the origin of the Roman idea of provocatio ad populum, so provocatio ad populum, a calling out towards the populace. Basically, you would, if you were condemned to death or another high crime, you could uh, appeal to the people. You could ask the people, the Roman people, if they would intercede on your behalf. If you know, people of Rome, should I have to be executed for what I did? And if the people, if the majority of the people cry out and, and side with you, then you can have your sentence commuted. And this may be the origin of that. Uh, so the Romans won the war with Alba Longa, and Alba Longa was forced to become a client or vassal state to, to the Romans. Uh, the Alban dictator, who has the best name ever, Medius Fufetius, Medius Fufetius uh, did not keep his faith to the Roman king Tullus Hostilius. So in the next war that Tullus, the Roman king, fought with the Etruscans, who the Etruscans famously live, here's Rome, the Latins, Etruscans live over here across the river. You can also see where the Sabines are and the Samnites and the Umbrians. So when the Alban king, Alba Longa is like somewhere around there where the M is in Rome, when the Alban king uh, was supposed to pledge his loyalty, pledge his troops and his army to the Romans to fight against the Etruscans, he did not do so. He withdrew his forces. Now, bad luck for him, the Etruscans lost that battle. The Roman king Tullus Hostilius won it, and when he got to Metius Fafetius, he punished him by tying uh, one side of his body, so an arm and a leg, to one chariot, and another side, the other side of his body, the other arm and the other leg, to another chariot. And he had the chariots, which were of course tied to horses, gallop off in different directions, because just as his loyalty had been divided, just so shall he be divided. And that apparently was the first time that had ever been done by the Romans, and maybe I think the last time also. I'll have to double check. Uh, so Tullus Hostilius, a little bit of a hostile dude, he failed to properly uh, pay heed to the gods. He totally ignored the gods, thought that it was not his place as king to have anything to do with the divine, which is wrong because the Roman office of Rex, king, you're, one of your duties <laughs> duty, is that you are king sacrificer. You're the chief of religion, chief sacrificer. And that's the way it was up until they uh, came up with the office of Pontifex Maximus. So he totally ignored that aspect of his, of his job, did not pay heed to the gods, so the gods saw fit to punish him in various ways. One of the ways in which they made stones rain on, on, the, Alban Mount, on the Alban Mount, on Mount Alba, at Alba Longa. So it rained rocks, and that of course freaked people out. And they begged Tullus to do something about it, and he, eh, just rocks, who cares? Rocks. What about rocks raining down from the sky? I'm sure that happens all the time somewhere in the world. At which point plague hits the city of Rome and it, it strikes Tullus, of course, particularly badly because, of course, hubris against the gods. Uh, this is when he, plague-ridden, rides out to the Alban Mount to try and make a sacrifice to, to Jupiter to I'm so sorry, please. I really didn't mean that. If you could just get rid of the plague, stop making it rain rocks, I'll, this this could work out, right? We could come to some sort of agreement. He does the sacrifice improperly because, of course, he never really paid attention. And Jupiter was so done with him that he just nuked him on the spot, just threw a lightning bolt and vaporized the king. So that was the end of him. The next king, the fourth king, uh, was Ancus Marcius, who was a Sabine. And like his Sabine predecessor, Numa Pompilius, he was big into religion. He revived almost all the religious institutions that were suppressed by the third king, Tullus Hostilius. He did, unlike Numa, make war upon the Latins, and he uh, settled a bunch of Latins on the Aventine Hill, right here. He uh, built the bridge across the Tiber here at the uh, Sublician Bridge. This hill right here, I know it's not labeled, but it is a hill. It's called the Janiculum Hill. And of course, it's across the Tiber River in Etruscan land. So Ancus Marcius, the fourth king, led a foray across a bridge that he had built, the Sublician Bridge, into Etruscan land, 
fortif made Roman fortifications here on the Janiculum Hill, build a wall like this to fortify the hill, put a flag on it so that if the Etruscans were to attack, the Romans would raise the flag. And this held true for centuries, even after the Etruscans were destroyed. Uh, if anyone raised that flag on the Janiculum Hill right here, the rest of the city sort of went on lockdown, even after the Etruscans were gone. Happened in the first century BC. Uh, so he took some land from the Etruscans, fortified that place. Uh, he built quite a bit, founded the port of Ostia. So Ostia is at the mouth of the Tiber River, so that's Rome's uh, seaport. He fell ill, and it seemed to be an illness of natural causes. And when he fell ill and he was near dying, uh, his vizier, so his right-hand man, his sort of minister of affairs, uh, an Etruscan who was named Lucumo. Lucumo uh, engineered so that as the king Ancus Marcius was falling ill, the two sons of Ancus would be out of the city. So I think he told them to go hunting or, you know, your father's not having a good day. You know, I'll, I'll check up on him in a little bit. If you guys, just to get your mind off things, why don't you, why don't you go hunting or something? You know, that's just something where you're not just waiting around for updates on your dad's condition. Just something to take your mind. Go take the dogs, take the horses, go, go get some running in, go, go hunt for a little bit and then come back. Of course, while they go out hunting, he closes the gates of the city and organizes uh, himself to be king because, of course, Ancus Marcius has been dead for a while. And he's, of course, been lying to his sons. So while the two sons are out, uh, he has a vote put together that he himself is made the king. And he wins that vote. So an Etruscan named Lucumo becomes king. Now, he is known by his more Romanized name, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. And an explanation of where he came from in his name is that, yes, he's known as the Etruscan Lucumo, Etruscan word for king is Lucumo, so coincidence. He had left uh, Etruria, the, uh, I don't think it's on this map, uh, the Etruscan city of Tarquini. So he's from Tarquini, uh, hence his name, Lucius Tarquinius. And he had left uh, Tarquini with his wife Tanaquil for better prospects across the river, the Tiber, in Rome. While he was entering the city, an eagle swooped out of the sky, grabbed his hat, the cap that he was wearing on his head, circled his head three times, then swooped down, put the cap back onto his head, and then flew off. And Tanaquil, the wife of Lucius Tarquinius of Lucumo, was well versed in prophecy, and she interpreted this to mean that the eagle, which is Jupiter's bird, which is Jove's bird, had flown down from the heavens, had taken a hat off his head, circled th his head three times, which is a favorable omen, and then had placed the hat back on his head as if the eagle, Job's bird, were crowning him. So she realized that big things, regal, kingly things, were probably going to come from this man. So the two of them, both Lucumo, we'll call him Lucius from now on, and his wife Tanaquil, they engineered it so that they ingratiated, ingratiated themselves to the, the royal family with Ancus Marcius, and that's how he got to become the right-hand man, the vizier of the king Ancus Marcius. And that's how he was able to engineer so that the sons of Ancus would be out of the city when the father, the king, died, and then he would engineer himself to become the next king. And it worked. So this first Etruscan king, he increased the number of senators. He built the early Circus Maximus, the chariot, uh, the racing ring. He uh, started the construction of the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, which is a uh, temple of Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill, right here. And he built the Cloaca Maxima. And uh, the, the Circus Maximus is right here. It's nestled between the Aventine Hill and the Palatine Hill. It will not become a permanent structure for many centuries, but uh, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus was the first to sort of lay the foundations for it. This whole area of Rome, uh, when the Tiber River floods, it gets rather swampy. So uh, until they could figure out the drainage swamp problem, they couldn't build any permanent structures here. So it would take a while. He also built the Cloaca Maxima. And the Cloaca Maxima, I think, I believe it starts at the Esquiline, and it's uh, the big sewer 
that runs underneath the city and it empties into the Tiber River. Do not swim downstream. Tiber, swim upstream by the field of Mars, not down. That's bad. So Lucius Tarquinius Priscus was assassinated by the sons of Ancus because, of course, you know, they're just not going to take that lying down. They eventually do come back. They engineer um, an assassination of the king, of the guy that um, that took the took the vote of uh, king from them. They uh, struck him. I always heard it was with an axe. And uh, I don't see how you get up from that. But, you know, it could have been a blunt instrument. So anyway, he was struck in the head. And he was taken to, the king was struck in the head by the assassins, and he was taken to the palace, or he was taken to the king's house, and he was he put down on bed to have a lie down. Tanaquil, the wife, of course, she, she's still kind of a scheming character. She closes the door so and uh, tells everybody outside, no, no, I will be taking care of the king. As his wife, I will be tending to him and seeing to him. So she routinely goes back inside the room to... To, to see how the king is, to tend to his wounds and whatnot. And then she gets up to, um, and then she will uh, get up to go outside the room and, and announce to everyone, give an update on the king's condition. And the king has been dead this whole time. It's not, it, it's, it's a big secret that he's no longer alive. He's no longer with us, but she's going to, as is her character, She's going to engineer that the next king is going to be someone who uh, who's on her side. And she has someone in mind, and that is Servius. And you can tell by his name, Servius Tullius. Servius, he probably originally started off as a slave, and indeed he did. So we are now on the sixth king of Rome, Servius Tullius. He was also an Etruscan. He was an Etruscan slave. An Etruscan slave in the household of uh, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. Uh, he was, by many omens, kind of picked out to be king, in sort of the same way that Lucius Tarquinius Priscus was picked out by an omen to be king, and Tanaquil noticed and went, ooh, I'll pay attention to that. The same thing happened with Servius Julius. One of the stories is that he's napping uh, as a slave. He's napping on a couch, and she passes by when his head bursts into flame but did not burn. And she thought that was interesting enough, and maybe that's a sign that he's going to become the next king. So she totally backs him. When when her husband is clearly dead, having been hit in the head with a blunt instrument or axed in the brain, and clearly he's dead, she's lying that he's still alive, he, he, he's getting progressively better. He could pull through. In the, in the meantime, she's doing backdoor dealings to get Servius Tullius to become the next king. Uh, because of the omens that had surrounded him that she had noticed, she had married one of her daughters, uh, Tarquinia, to Servius Julius. So there was a link between uh, this one slave and the, the royal family. And she had preferred him to her own sons because of these omens. Because she had had two sons with Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, and they are Lucius Tarquinius and Aurens Tarquinius. They'll come back. So Servius Julius becomes the sixth king. Uh, he reformed the Roman census in counting Rome's population and citizens. He divided the city into wards, or regiones, re regions. Uh, built a wall around the city, and this you can see right here, the Servian Wall, the Murus Servituli. And remains of that wall uh, exist to this day. You can still see um, some small parts of this wall still standing in Rome today. Uh, he reformed the army because it was, of course, based on a citizen's age, experience, and wealth. So it depended on what gear a citizen could afford. And that is based on the census. On When, when they come to your house, they to, to count how many citizens they are, they also want to know your age, they want to know what your military experience is, and how much wealth you have. Because if you have enough wealth, you can afford better gear, because you would bring your own gear to battle. The state is not going to supply you with arms yet. Uh, you, if you had enough uh, money, you could you could bring a horse. If you can uh, afford a horse to keep a horse to ride a horse into battle, that's that's up to you. And you would be in a higher class, which come to be known as the equites, the knights, uh, the horse riders, because they have to have enough money to own and keep a horse. Uh, Servius Tullius, the sixth king, had married his two daughters off to. 
the two sons of the previous king, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus. So he has two daughters, Tulia I and Tulia II, Tulia the Elder and Tulia the Younger. You can call her Tulia Prima and Tulia Secunda. And he marries them off to Lucius Tarquinius and Aruns Tarquinius, the sons of the, pre the preceding king. It is Tulia the Younger who is the evil one. She wants to hook up with Lucius Tarquinius, who is also the evil one. Lucius Tarquinius wants to hook up with Tulia the Younger, the evil one. But they're married to the different sibling. Lucius is married because he's the elder Tarquinius. He marries Tulia the Elder, and Tulia the Younger has married Arens Tarquinius, the younger Tarquinius. So the two evil ones, that's Tulia the Younger and Lucius Tarquinius, they kill their respective spouses so that they can then marry each other and create an unholy union of evilness. So they hook up, they marry, they one day go to the Senate under armed guard. They have a retinue of, of armed people amongst them. They go into the Senate and they begin to criticize Servius who, you know, for Tulia, that's her father. And for Lucius, that's, um, that, that's his father-in-law. They, they refer to his servile slave origins. They begin to criticize him for favoring the poor instead of the proper good patrician citizens of Rome. They call him a traitor. Finally, when the king, Servius Tullius, gets word of this and he goes down to the, the Senate house, the Curia, to, to see about this, when he climbs the steps, the two of them meet him there at the top of the steps, that is Lucius Tarquinius and uh, Tulia, his daughter, and they push him, the king, down the stairs, and there he falls to his death, the bottom having broken his neck. Uh, the daughter, Tulia, gets in her chair, gets in her carriage, and she orders the driver to ride over her father's body over and over again, back and forth. And this street upon which she did this is referred to <laughs> Excuse me. As the Vicus Scelaratus, or the Street of Crime, or Criminal's Way, because that's that's pa that's a parricide, that's patricide, which is one of the worst crimes to a Roman. So for Tulia to murder her father and Lucius Tarquinius to murder uh, his father-in-law, well, he's given the nickname Superbus, and this is of course the seventh and last most evil king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus. Lucius the Arrogant, Superbus, the Arrogant, the Haughty, the Proud. Lucius Tarquin the Proud. And of course, he's the really, really bad king. He's the one that killed senators and, and citizens, and he did all sorts of evil, bad stuff. He's the father of Sextus Tarquinius, who goes on to rape the Roman matron Lucretia. And that, of course, begins the Roman Republic. So the Last king, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, is so bad that the Romans decide that monarchy, one ruler, a monos arcos, a sole wielder of power, just is not for them. And, they're, and this is what wakes up them up to the idea of checks and balances, that they're not going to put all power into one person. So it's after Lucius Tarquinius Superbus where we get the Republic. So remember, all of these kings in order. Romulus, a Latin, Numa Pompilius, a Sabine, Tullus Hostilius, a Latin, Ancus Marcius, a Sabine, Lucius Tarquinius Priscus, an Etruscan, Servius Tullius, an Etruscan, Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, an Etruscan.